<laughs> Welcome to the cult classic horror show. Every week, you can have the conversations you've always wanted to have about the films you love. Shut up! Get rid of your distractions and prepare yourself you got a big surprise coming to you. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome everybody to the Cult Classic Horror Show. Danny Bonin here with you guys. Scotty Bonin here with you guys. We are the Blood Brothers. The Blood Brothers. And uh, today we have a very special guest on the line with us, uh, Travis Stevens, writer, director of Girl on the Third Floor. Welcome, Travis. Hello, hello. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Now, Thanks for joining uh, us, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna put the disclaimer because it's it's so awesome that Travis may have to run and go puke because he's been up partying all night. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like I'm personally responsible. I want to blame filmmaker Joe Bagos, whose movie Bliss is out now, and uh, his movie VFW uh, Pangoria is putting out soon. I'm gonna blame him for how <laughs> shitty I feel right now. I'm not all gonna right. take any personal responsibility <laughs> for this. Because, you know, holy yeah. hell. You know, well, <laughs> my my uh, my excuse is uh, much more nerdy. I drank a lot of water this morning and might have to go pee. <laughs> okay. There we go. Yeah, well, you know, well, you know, uh, Travis, you have to celebrate because Joe's movie is just is just released now. Girl on the third floor, you know, is is released tomorrow. So there's room for celebration and drinking. I mean, totally. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's room, and then much like the uh, main character in our film, there's idiocy. And, yes. Uh, perhaps yes. I tipped a little further into the poor decision uh, sphere than, than yeah. I did. <laughs> hey, you know, Don, Don's a great man, and, you know, he makes some bad decisions, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, before yeah, everybody, everybody has a chance to redeem themselves, you know. Yeah, you yeah. <laughs> well, obviously we're here to talk about uh, Girl on the Third Floor, but before we, we sort of jump into that, um, sort of like to delve into to your background just a little bit, Travis. Um, I know that you've been involved uh, as a producer and with your production company, uh, Snowfort, with a couple of my favorite modern horror films, if that's what you want to call it, um, Starry Eyes and um, We're Still Here. I love those films. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and so yeah. so tell me how sort of how you got into well just film in general and then specifically the horror genre. Yeah, I mean my first conscious uh uh memory of being alive was watching uh, a horror film through the vent in my family's van in the <laughs> early 70s like wow. Uh I I just horror has always been a part of my my sort of DNA and uh, you know while I've, I've made other films, I've made documentaries but there's other stories I want to tell you know I think it's, it's it, horror is one of my favorite foods and I can eat it several times a week and yeah. not, uh, not get sick of it so um, yeah so I feel really fortunate to, to uh, over the course of my career have, have met um interesting filmmakers who are trying to do fun stuff with the genre or within the genre. And, uh, so yeah, Dennis and Kevin from starry eyes and Ted Gagan from we are still here. Like those are my friends as well as, uh, uh, you know, creative partners. Um, so sure. yeah, I feel very lucky. Wow. That's and awesome. Was it, was film something that, um, you know, you knew from a child at a childhood that you wanted to pursue? Did you, uh, you know, head straight into it? Were you making, were you making super eight films in high school? You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's a good question. Um, so we, I didn't have a camera. My, my, uh, godfather had a video camera. So every time, um, there would be like a, a group event at his house, we would put on skits. 
and he would film them. So, uh, you know, from a young age, that that idea of putting on a show was something that uh, I was drawn to and, and something I did a lot of. Uh, when I got a bit older, it turned into uh, making skate movies, like skateboarding. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, nice. That and editing that. Yeah, so you'd, you'd, you'd edit you know, using the camera as one uh, tape deck and, and your VCR as the other and do these sort of rudimentary, uh, uh, you know, montages set to whatever, Metallica or Run <laughs> DMC or whatever. Uh, yeah. And so that that was it. And, you know, so I've always painted, I've always written. And, you know, when I had access to uh, equipment, you know, just made stuff and, you know, very basic, but you're still being creative. And I think it informs uh, what you do as an adult. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's great. Do you um, just side note, do you have uh, do you have family or children? I do. I have a five year old daughter and, uh, you know, I'm just not trying to handicap her uh, professional uh, success, but I'm always <laughs> like, hey, maybe uh, maybe we should paint some more. Maybe yeah. uh, we should write a story. Like, let's be creative. Yeah. And uh, her, her mom is like, you should be a doctor or an actor. <laughs> like, yes, yes, that makes a lot more sense financially than being an artist, but uh, so we'll see where she ends you up. you got to follow your passion, follow with daddy's footsteps. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah. Yeah. So how did how did Snowfort Pictures and this production company um, that you founded come together? Yeah, just uh, I had worked in uh, script development and worked for other production companies and worked for companies that uh, sort of sold movies internationally and made a lot of TV movies. And I, I just sort of got a basic understanding of the economics of independent film and then it was like, all right, well, now's the time to make my move and actually get back to making them because, uh, yeah. you know, uh, working, working on stuff is great, but it's even better if you actually uh, care about the movie, sure. uh, mm-hmm. you know, and the message of the movie. So that, that was it with Snowford. I was like, I just want to make cool shit. Mm-hmm. And I want to make movies that have something interesting to say. Uh, and I feel very lucky to have been doing it for almost ten years now. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, I was I was looking down the uh, long the long list of the movies that y- they, that you have produced with uh, Snowfort, and there is definitely a uniqueness and um, it just very something special to them, and they all bring something different to the table. It seems like I, I like Danny was saying Starry Eyes. Um, I I've only seen Starry Eyes, but now I'm really intrigued to watch the rest of what you guys have done. And, um, and I was reading here, it's like, it's something different you're bringing to the audience, uh, that maybe they haven't seen before. So it's kind of like a refreshing thing to watch as, you know, you see all these sequels and prequels coming out and remakes. Um, so it's really cool, uh, to see something different, you know, and is, is that kind of what you guys are trying to do? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think if you've got limited, uh, resources, like if you're making a movie for, for very little money, mm-hmm. you gotta, the movie's gotta have something to say. Otherwise nobody's going to pay attention to it because you don't have movie stars. You don't have car crashes. You don't, uh, you're not doing any of the stuff that, uh, the movies that people are going to the theaters to see. So you, you, you damn well better have something of yeah. value in, in the idea and in the execution. And so, yeah, that's, that's like, um, punk rock kid. And like, that's kind of what I want to do with my movies. I want to be the discord, uh, so records cool. of, of indie cinema stuff. Yeah. That's how, that's awesome. how, how much from the beginning, from the inception of your production company, I mean, uh, were, are you picking and choosing these films and people to work with? Are you like, Hey, shoot me the script. I want to make sure there's something to say. I want to approve this before we do anything with it. Or, or are some of these from like inception? Did you know you wanted to work with these people and just say, Hey, write me a script. I will work with you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's all pretty organic and, and it varies from situation to situation, but the, 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 they all shared the same starting point, which is, yeah, you're cool. Let's figure it out. Let's make something together. And, and whether it's, oh, well, I got a script or I have an idea, uh, it's all pretty fluid from there. But, um, 
Yeah, I would say, in my experience, all of the movies that we've made have been uh, sort of a really collaborative process. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, there, I, there are producers that I respect and, and, and learn a lot from who are very sort of uh, hands-off. And it's, you know, the filmmaker, the writer, director comes and brings them a project and that producer does their job and, and they stay in their lane. Uh, my experience has been different. It's, it's a lot more sort of, like, like I said earlier, let's put on a show. And so the writers and directors and cast and me all sort of uh, get together and, and figure it out. Uh, together usually mm -hmm. yeah uh, so it's a very like collaborative effort effort which I think just helps the film so much when everyone's on on the same page and you're going for the same goal and you have the same vision that's when you when good things happen <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. With, any, with any art form the ability to uh, bounce your ideas off of somebody else uh, if you respect them it just uh, gives you a chance to make sure that your intention is, is coming across clear, you know, and, you know, like a record producer is doing the same thing. You know, the band, it's not just the band gets in there and does their thing. The producer's like, oh, you know, I think maybe the guitar should come in here or da 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 da, da. Like there's this, this uh, outside uh, sort of perspective on what's being created that can make the thing work even better than if the people who are making it just do it uh, on their own. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, oh yeah, definitely. It's so true. We've tried to write a few things here and there and it's like, you think that, that you have it all figured out and then you, you get someone to look at it or you have another perspective and, and it just opens up a so much better version of things. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 It's like, I never saw it that way, but that is so much better. <laughs> yeah, so it, yeah. it is really cool, yeah, to have that. Um, well, I guess... Yeah, and sometimes, well, before you move on, I mean, sometimes even if you come out of that uh, conversation more convinced that your idea is right, that's still a value. Yeah. You know, it's not always like, uh, you know, necessarily that you need to change anything, but that 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 opportunity to present your ideas is there's something of value getting that feedback before it's certainly in a movie before it's up there on a the screen, you mm -hmm. know, so whether it's, um, uh, sharing your script with people you trust before you make it doing, uh, read throughs with actors, uh, and, and people in the room to get a sense of how the thing, uh, flows, uh, test screenings once you've made it throughout that process, you're, 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 you're getting invaluable feedback that's only going to make the movie better. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. for sure. Definitely. Uh, I, I now I apologize. I didn't uh, sift through everything. Have Have you uh, in your production company at Snowfort? Have you done some non horror horror titles as well? Yeah, I mean we've done uh, probably the biggest one is a documentary named Jodorowsky's Dune, which is an exploration oh, yeah. of. Uh, uh, that filmmaker's failed attempt to, to make a Dune movie. Um, I have a skateboard documentary we're working on now. We've done, uh, we did sort of a, a trippy drama called Buster's Mal Heart from Sarah Dina Smith starring Rami Malek and Caitlin Scheel. Um, we've done, uh, I did a, a teen thriller called Teenage Cocktail about two girls who start a relationship and uh, sort of get led astray uh, by a by a uh, a male. Um, yeah. Nice. So I mean, with, okay. with anything like for me, genre is just a, a a different instrument. You know. Sure. 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 Are, yeah. Are you pretty satisfied with uh, you know sticking with genre and in independent, or or you you know have larger goals of of getting some of that studio money? <laughs> Yeah, I would love to to be able to to do both. You know, I, I want to make a GI Joe movie, and I also want to make small, weird, fucked up art films. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, if there was a way to, to do both simultaneously. That would be ideal. Yeah, awesome. oh, yeah. Uh, definitely. I, just definitely. just curious, as we're talking here, Travis, where where are you based out of? Uh, I live in LA. Okay. Okay. And uh, nice. I'm from from Vermont. 
So I feel like a Vermonter, uh, even though I've lived in LA since '96. So. Oh wow! Oh, okay. Wow! So you've been there for all. Do you do uh, ever travel back home to uh, Vermont, or are you mainly just in LA the whole time? Yeah, it, you know, usually around once a year. Uh, oh, cool! I just, uh, it's real nice to get around. Uh, I don't know. There's something. L.A. can be very uh, uh, consistently uh, sunny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I've, heard, uh, I've heard some stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you don't quite. It's uh, always nice to get home. <laughs> you don't quite get to experience all the the seasons. We're actually in Colorado, based near Denver, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's nice. Um, well, yeah, let's let's sort of uh, tackle this this film. And so, Girl on the Third Floor. Yeah, this is Girl on the Third Floor. This is your uh, writing and directorial debut for a feature that you put out, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, produced by Queensberry Pictures, so it's, it's not a Snowfort title, but I, I you know brought the same approach to it, which is what is this movie really about? Not just yeah. what happens in it, but what are we trying to say with it? And mm-hmm. that was the starting point. It's like uh, the house actually uh, is rumored to be haunted. Uh, yeah. It was supposedly a bordello. It sits across the street from a church, and two women were reported to have been uh, killed in the house. So all so of that, that is the reality. Uh, and that was all wow. in place. And so my job was, well, to come up with a story that – sort of built off of those uh, known details mm. and come up with something that isn't just uh, a compelling story, but kind of also honors the, the history of the house. Not like a, uh, you know, like a uh, biography, but mm. it's like, all right, well, if you're going to film a uh, haunted house movie in an actual haunted house, how do you do it without it not being totally exploited of the, <laughs> the people who actually suffered there? And that was, that was my approach. Okay. That's so cool. So, so you guys actually had the house and um, before, so you had the house and you knew you wanted to make a movie there and did, was the yeah. script kind of in fruition before that? Or did you, or did, did you have the house and then you started writing or did you, already kind of had some yeah. something written already. Nope. It, it all started with the house. And oh, that's so cool. Completely designed for that house. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, and coming to it from uh, being a producer, I was able to write gags that I knew we could pull off from the, the budget we had. Uh, mm-hmm. And so because we actually owned the house, that meant we could destroy the house which freed up money to do other fun stuff like get yeah. inside the walls of the house or get inside the uh, the guts of the house, which is something you, you normally wouldn't be able to do on a, a yeah. small indie film. Yeah, so, I did. So, yeah, that was so cool. I, I did see in another interview that, uh, yeah, that, that Dark Sky Films bought bought the house. And well, I'm just curious, like, what what is it doing now? You guys tore it up. Are they, like, renovating it or something? <laughs> the last time I saw it, it was filled with goo and holes in the wall. I don't know what they've done with it since. Uh, I don't know if they're going to start, to, you know, charging people money to try to spend the night there or something. But, yeah, they own it. Wow. And, 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 and where is it located again? Frankfort, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Okay. Yeah. I like, wow. I know Ella, Illinois is like famous for like being one of the, you know, like the epicenter of, of like haunted houses and like haunted places. So that's so it, when you when you guys were there. So it's actually a true story. So two girls got murdered in that house. Did you guys ever feel any kind of paranormal spookiness when you were filming or anything weird happen ever? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, and I would make this caveat. Like, I know anytime somebody makes a haunted house movie, they in interviews they're like, "Yeah, at our place, it really was." And like, yeah. this house was fucked up. And I, <laughs> the the night I got there for pre production, I walked across the street and walked into the house thinking. I'm thinking like I was gonna do like a victory lap, like <laughs> like yeah, I'm gonna. And the minute I within seconds of walking into the house, I felt this sense of dread in my chest and literally backed myself up against the the uh, window in the living room and sat down and was like, whoa, 
<laughs> what, what the hell is going on? Get out. Yeah. And I had this feeling of like, get out. And I was like, what? And I was like, are you just tripping out? Are you nervous? Like, because you've never directed before? Like, go walk into the kitchen. Get over it. And I couldn't. <laughs> I literally couldn't walk any further in the house. I just had this overwhelming wow. feeling of like, uh, just uh, uh, forbidden. Mm -hmm. And so I went outside and was like, holy shit, like, what am I going to do? How are we going to make a movie here? Like, it was so, you know, it's not that there was like an apparition or something. Uh, I probably would have had a heart attack, but it was just this energy. Yeah. And, and I was like, how, how are we ever going to uh, uh, get through filming a movie here? If this is what the, the, the vibe of the house is like. Yeah. like. I couldn't even walk into the kitchen. So, I went back inside and just started talking to the house. And, and, and I mean, it sounds silly, but I was like, here's what, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm going to honor, you know, whatever trauma actually took place here. I'm going to be respectful. We're going to make this movie. And we, you know, I just want you to be cool with that. And I talked my way through the first floor. I talked my way up to the second floor. And when it came time to go to the attic, I was like, yeah, fuck that. I'll save that for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck that. I am not going up the yeah. attic. That's crazy. Yeah. Did you have, I mean, did, did anyone else sort of corroborate some of these feelings? I mean, any of the actors, the crew members? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, most, I think the people who are in the house the most would be the art department. So, you know, they're working until 4 a.m. Uh, but there were multiple, like, it's, for me, it was like I'm meeting against the wall with the other producer, and we're talking, and you know, there's a little pause on the conversation, and we hear <laughs> a knocking on the wall, oh, and shit. we look, and there's nobody there. Uh, with the production designers, Courtney and Hillary Anduar, uh, we're looking at a door, like being like, hmm, should we move this door to the other room? And all of a sudden, the door pops open. Oh, oh shit. my God. And it's just like, Lots of little, like, playful things like that. And then, you know, in, in uh, talking to other people since, like, while making it, we weren't always like, oh, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? But, but now, you know, enough time's gone by that, you know, the, the sound uh, lab said tons of their work was uh, about getting, they, they were basically getting, uh, like, fucked up weird audio signals oh, on geez. all of the, uh, the tapes. Um, you know, and people in the house would be like, yeah, no, I just felt this presence in the basement and, and just had to get out of there. Oh, so, yeah, but it was, it's a haunted house. It's like, and while we're filming it, constantly people are, are walking by the house being like, hey, have you seen the ghost? <laughs> yeah. and like, mostly people have their own experiences with the house. Shit. It's a it's a haunted house, man. Legit. Jeez. Yeah. It's That's insane. Yeah. So, so all the were all the interior shots within the movie all filmed in the house. Then, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, oh. So everything that was filmed was in the. That's so cool. On so, location. I mean, you know, you know, you usually get that like everything filmed on location. You know, some at times it's like seventy percent filmed here, but then we had to go here to film yeah. this and here. So that, no, how I, cool is that? I, I want to know uh, in the in the film you have that viewing area in that upstairs bedroom. Did you guys build that? Yeah, it's actually in the house. How weird is that? It was that in there already. Uh, yeah, it was already there. And what? so I don't know why it's there, but I think the reason I gave in the movie is probably the best reason. How do yeah. you have a balcony over your bed? I don't get it. Yeah, that's wow. that's what a genius idea to to put what you put in. It's a obviously uh, we're, we aren't giving anything away, but it, it's a viewing area as as a brothel for all these guys or whatever watching uh, uh, girls get tortured. Well, so. we can we can give yeah. it away. You guys you guys should have watched this movie by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you yeah, it, did you guys then fill it in to show the ceiling portion of it when it wasn't there? Yeah. Okay. Yep. That was, and again, it's uh, you know coming to it from a producing background, you you sort of know what's achievable for your budget and what's not, and that was one thing that I was like, 
Yeah, no, we can do that. that that's affordable, and it'll it'll feel like a big, uh, you know, sort of transition in the movie, and it'll be really great. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. This week's horror halftime is brought to you by Iconic Canvas. Do you have a lot of empty space on your wall, or do you have that perfect image that you would like to create into a multi-panel canvas or a single canvas and throw it up on your wall? Well, if so, Iconic Canvas has the perfect solution for you. Check them out at IconicCanvas.net. All canvases are stretched over wood frames with solid wood backing and are ready to hang upon arrival. Each canvas is handmade with care right when you order it and and inspected for quality before shipment. They use the latest technology in HD printing to bring you the most vibrant, eye-catching canvas possible. All of their products are backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can purchase without hesitation. 100% pine wood handmade frames, museum-quality canvas material. Uh, It also comes with coated metal hooks on the back, so you can hang those. Although, I actually recommend hanging them with command strips. Money plug for command strips. They didn't even ask me. What do you know? Reinforce backing on all prints so that your prints never sag. (gasps) Never. They have hundreds of five-star reviews. Check them out at iconiccanvas.net. You can browse their selection of pre-made designs uh, all the way from abstract art involving movies, horror movies. Check out their horror section. I like it. Uh, Just search film or uh, click on their film category and you'll see plenty of goodies in there. Uh, landscape photography, shots of space. Who doesn't want to see images of fucking outer space? All the way to landmarks, animals, you name it, they have it on a canvas. And if they don't have it on a canvas, you can create your own canvas set. Simply upload any image you would like to use, as long as it's large enough, and they will turn it into your very own custom canvas set. Use the code CCH during checkout to get 15% off your order. That's the word, the letters C C H. Use that during checkout at iconiccanvas.net to get 15% off your order. So yeah, let's, I, I want to dig in this. So, so obviously, um, we, we have, uh, um, Phil, Phil, Phil Brooks, uh, slash CM Punk starring in it as, as Don. Um, he comes to buy, to buy the house with, with his yeah, well, I uh, guess wife. to fix it up, right? He comes to fix up a house that they that, <laughs> to that, fix that it they've up. bought. Yeah, <laughs> and, there's like uh, lit. Yeah, tell tell me a little bit. Um, was CM Punk someone that you sort of knew you wanted to work with, or or was the script coming together and you you know the name just came up? How did that decision come about? Well, because the the house is outside Chicago and it's an actual haunted house like from the very beginning i was like i want this to be a chicago movie and i want uh you know to cast locally i I just wanted it to be as close to reality as possible sure and early on in the in the sort of casting process um phil's name had come up and while he wasn't you know the first person i had thought of i was like yeah because I just, and I knew him as a martial artist and, and had watched his fights and more importantly had watched his interviews leading up to his fights and his interviews after his fights. Uh, this had nothing to do with the movie. I was just really curious. Like, uh, it was interesting to me that Straight Edge had sort of entered the mainstream through his career in wrestling. Yep. And it was interesting to me that, uh, you know, in a guy who didn't need to start fighting had actually started fighting professionally just because he loved it. Like I was like, this is just a fascinating dude. And, um, so when his name was suggested, you know, he's a Chicago guy. I was like, yeah, I think he's, I think he's authentic. I think he's real. I think he has a good heart. I think he'll get what we're doing here. And then it just uh, became, you know, tweaking the script to sort of support him, uh, as an actor and, and, you know, support kind of deconstruct his his uh, his iconography a little bit. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, he's. Yeah. I mean, he's done well. This was, from what I can tell, anyways, looking at his IMDb. I mean, this is sort of his first like film role, right? Like a yeah, lead role. He had, he, yeah, he had done a couple uh, days on uh, the Suska uh, sisters' Rabbit. 
Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Uh, I wasn't sure if Rabbit was before or before. after this one. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it was literally, they shot, like, his scenes, I think, a week or two before we started. So, th- this was all new to him. But he had done Mark Marin's show, Marin. Mm. Uh, and, you know, being a wrestler is being a performer. And yeah. so, it's not quite the same as, you know, if, if he, he'd never performed before. Yeah. So, I think he really took to it uh, right off the bat. I think he came yeah. in prepared. He's got a yeah. he's got a very and I never really realized this until I see him done up his hair and everything in this role. He just reminds me a lot of Henry Rollins in there, like a younger Henry Rollins. <laughs> That's what people say: Henry Rollins or Bruce Campbell or John Hamm. Uh, Bruce Campbell. Yeah. I, oh yeah. I see Bruce Campbell. Now that you I, said I, Bruce Campbell, Campbell right I can, yeah. Now that you said Bruce Campbell, I can picture that for sure. <laughs> he, he like looks like yeah. John Hamm, and but he like kind of like speaks like Bruce Campbell. It's so cool. <laughs> I just love the dynamics yeah. that uh, that he has, and his character is so great in this. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I think. Yeah, it, he, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, uh, just like uh, part of the fun was he had such a distinct look during his wrestling career. And to really sort of create a new look with him for the film was was a lot of fun. And so I don't know. I just I think sometimes when wrestlers make that transition to movie, the films just kind of put the wrestler into the world yeah. instead of sort of you know creating a new character. And I think uh, both Bill and I. Uh, both recognize like no no you need to kind of become something new otherwise people are only going to see your previous uh, you know fame yeah, well, and I've, you want them to see the character I right? think it was for sure I think it was yeah, br- brilliant I, uh, I think he did a brilliant job uh, knowing his background because you're absolutely right Travis I mean you look at Brock Lesnar's done a couple of movies, or even MMA fight Randy Couture, and uh, I mean The Rock yeah. has obviously gotten away with it. He's a fucking superstar <laughs> now, but but you have all these guys, John Cena, who get in movies, and the first thing they just do are these sort of B action movies. And for CM Punk to do this role, which is not very really action packed at all, there's and it's it's more of a, this dreadful horror movie. He does get to pound a girl in the head with a hammer, you know, but. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not. I think he was smart for taking the role and for seeking out horror films because it, it does get, allow him to show a different side of himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, uh, and, uh, obviously, I'm biased, but I think he fucking knocked it out of the park. Like, I oh think yeah, he really, he's acting in this movie and he's doing a great job with it it's not he's not just being himself and i think with a lot of those other movies it's, yeah. Yeah. i mean i yeah. love ready couture but the expendables i'm like what the fuck are you doing in that he's movie himself. Like, where are they? <laughs> yeah, he's exactly. himself oh it's so true so yeah. so working with cm punk was it was he I mean, super open to your direction and uh, not, I mean, I, I imagine him as a down-to-earth guy, not very egotistical at all with his wrestling career. Yeah. No, it, it, was, it was the best, uh, you know, for the bulk of the movie, it's him and a dog yeah. and me. You yeah. Know, I mean, obviously there's the crew there, but we're, that dynamic would have been terrible if the dog, me, or Phil had been an asshole. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, sure. It, it, yeah, we're very poor, and, and perhaps I am an asshole, so I, I, I don't know. But, <laughs> but for the three of us, it it, uh, it really made a huge difference, at least to me, to have somebody who's such a down-to-earth hard worker uh, as well as talented. Like, he would just show up, and he's, and he's like, what are we doing today? I was like, today, the house is going to bit goo on you he's like great let's do it and i'm like i love this dude <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, i love it oh god yeah i mean i i do love it like it's just him and his and his dog cooper uh, i i just love that feel of just him by himself with his dog and the house is doing all these weird things well, that feeling isolation and I, like oh my god isolation is a big uh favorite of, of scotty and i's in horror and i yeah. also we also just we watched another interview of yours a little bit before this and uh you talked about how uh, the Shining is one of your favorite movies, and I can definitely see a lot of uh, some of the filming coming out uh, from that. Not, yeah. not that it's like 
uh, super reminiscent of Kubrick, but you know, some of these scenes, some of the, the close-ups, some of the way that this film was shot. I mean, were you taking some of that from these older films? Yeah. And, and, uh, I'm not a fan of like homage cinema, which sure. is like the, which is just a riff where like, yeah, yeah, that's just like that guy's movie or that girl's movie. Like, but, you still have your your influences, and, and for me, the The Shining is one of the greatest haunted house movies ever made. Oh, uh, love it! It's it's, it's one of our favorites. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, I mean, part of that is what the story is about and how the story is is shot, and so that was the the sort of. Uh, the the uh, touchstone. I was like, I just wanted to, everybody to work as hard as they can to make a movie as good as The Shining. We'll never get there, but if we at least try, then yeah. we're in the right direction. And so, yeah, there's a there's a formal uh, sort of approach to to how this film is is shot and constructed that was heavily influenced by The Shining, which is basically. You're looking at a character, the character's looking at something, the something's looking back at the character. Yes. And that's how the movie's constructed. Oh, uh, yeah. Just, I, that's, that's why I like this so much, because it, it had that feel, and I, I'm like, the, the, the Shining is my favorite film, too, so that's, uh, it was so good, yeah. Yeah, It what, what was sort of reminiscent for me was some of these uh, shots just on the walls, just on the house itself, you know, yeah. where it's it might be a, a slow... Uh, pull in on the wall or something and and a lot of that slow moving camera of just the structure itself was was sort of bringing me back to the shining a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah exactly definitely yeah. uh, an influence and and you actually you sorry you 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 talked about some of like the goo and stuff the the practical the practical special effects were were very unique and different in this and you know just like the goo coming out of the the uh the plugs the uh, the outlets and then the wall with like the, all the black sludge um i i just love that and especially when he was like underneath the sink and all and he breaks the pipe and the black black yeah. sludge just goes all like all over space <laughs> yeah. i just you know you just got to go all all out with that stuff and i liked how you guys did that this is where this is where you channel what i feel is your inner evil dead 2 with uh sort of the walls bleeding yeah. goo and, yeah. and getting the actor yes. dirty as hell <laughs> yes. yeah yeah i mean uh, I don't know about you, but like I like my horror movies to feel like horror movies, and yeah. uh, so it was fun to just start going wild with this stuff and be like, "No, we're not. This is not a psychological thriller. This yeah. is the house is doing what it's doing." You know? Yeah, yeah. we're not we're not tiptoeing around this. We're going to go all out. Yeah, I I just yeah. love that. Well, that was really cool. Speaking of the cinematography, I mean, uh, how much of it uh, was it? Scott Scott Thiel? Is that how you say it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Scott, Scott Thiel, cinematographer. Was that, um, how much were you sort of saying, I want this? And how much did he have free reign to just do what he would like? You know. I don't know if it'll always be like this, <laughs> but uh, for my first movie, I think coming from a producing background, I wanted to know exactly what we were doing. So I, my month of pre-production in the house uh, was spent um, shot listing every single moment. Mm, so wow. in, on this particular movie, the relationship was, Scott, this is what the shot is. Mm -hmm. And then Scott's job was to uh, execute it beautifully. And he did. You know, he's got... I, I don't mean to diminish uh, his work because... He's incredible, and he's shooting a movie right now with a friend, uh, Jacob Gentry, that uh, I can't wait to see because he's fucking awesome. But uh, yeah. on this particular movie, it was it was here's what we're doing, make it look good. <laughs> yeah, and he did. Yeah, yeah like, this yeah. is what I want. I got these planned out. Make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. when you, when yeah, you have because, you... because go ahead. Sorry, I just I just say like I didn't want to leave anything up to chance. So when you when like a lot of people will shot list, but you know, there's this technique uh, that I learned back in the day where you line your script with each shot. So you're like, you know, you got a scene, it's two people at a table, and you're like, all right, I'm going to start with a wide shot. 
and you literally, with a ruler, draw a line through the the, the scene until you cut. You're like uh, on this line of dialogue, I'm going to cut to a close up, and then you start a new line that says close up on whatever Danny, you know, uh, for his line. And it's like a, a paper edit before you've even filmed, so you know exactly what you're going to shoot and how much you need to shoot. Wow. Uh, because I had just seen it on other films where sometimes a director would get into a, 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 a scene and just start covering the scene from top to bottom with a bunch of different angles. Yeah. And in their mind, they're like, and we'll figure it out in, in the edit bay. On this mm-hmm. movie, I wanted to spend as much time as possible on the fun stuff, like killer gags and the, the house you know, bleeding and all that stuff. I didn't want to have to spend time covering dialogue uh, yeah. with a bunch of stuff that's not going to end up in the movie. So, so I went into this one really wanting to do that pre-edit, that paper edit, uh, mm-hmm. and therefore it sort of dictated what we were going to shoot. Yeah, I, what also comes to my head as you're talking about this vision you had, and because I, I know exactly what you mean, where you've seen it in your head, you've edited it in your head, and so you don't want anyone to mess with it. <laughs> How was that um, as far as not being the producer on this film? Uh, did you pretty much still have free reign to do whatever you wanted, even though you weren't technically, you know, the head honcho producer in charge? Yeah, I mean, there's you're always going to uh, run up against uh, somebody maybe not understanding uh, why you like an idea. And it happened on this. There was stuff that I, I thought should be in the movie that didn't end up in the movie. And, uh, you know, that's just part of the, the collaborative process. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to ask you, uh, so the dog Cooper, um, what a, what a performance he did. Uh, he or she, right? He? Yeah, he. Yeah. Uh, he, I mean, like, was he one of the crews or the actors or someone that was part of the film's dog? Or was he, I mean, he did so well, like, on obeying yeah. and, and, and on, you know, barking and stuff. Uh, where'd, you, where'd you find him? He was, uh, uh, there was a, animal, a local animal trainer in the town. And he had never done any acting before, but uh, the trainer was like, no, he's a good dog. I, I think he could do it. And we met him and just such a sweetheart. And every day he was on the set, you know, everybody just was happier. You know, he, yeah. he just got to have this uh, joyful, <laughs> playful spirit there. Uh, and, it was, and it was great. And, and I feel terrible saying this now, but he passed away this summer. You know, oh, he did? So it's actually, yeah. So it's really kind of incredibly sad because it's like, uh, you know, and we'll talk to people a lot about him and people really, uh, you know, have this uh, affection for him oh, based on man. the movie. And and, and it just would have been nice for, I mean, I don't know if a dog understands that now you're getting famous, but it yeah, would have been yeah. nice for more people to get a chance to meet him. Yeah, um, he really is a sweetheart. Was a sweetheart. What's, his, what's, his, what's his name, Cooper, in in real life, too? No, Riker. In real Riker, life. okay. Yeah. And, and if, uh, guys, so so was he an older dog? Did he die of like natural causes, or was it just uh, something happened? Yeah, well, then I think he just got sick. Yeah, yeah. Any, any, and in obviously in girl on the third floor, he may or may not end up in the dryer. Uh, <laughs> oh, he, man. he didn't. He met, a, he met a. He met a. He met a better demise in real life. I'm guessing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The less, uh, uh, less painful one for sure. Yeah. 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 And what? that's a. Uh, Sorry, Danny, go for it. I was just going to say, I, I wanted to talk a little bit. Um, Sarah Brooks, I thought, really knocked it out of the park. And she's playing much, Sarah. <laughs> she, yeah, she's she's pretty much yeah. unknown. I mean, how did was this just something you held open auditions for? Or did you have her in mind already? Yes, yeah, she uh, sent a tape for uh, a one-line role that uh, takes place at the party scene. Mm-hmm. And from that one-line audition, I was like... Huh. And 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 I, I I felt like this through casting on on all of the movies that I've been involved with. It's 
sometimes you just get a vibe from someone. And you're like, yeah, this person, <laughs> yeah, not charisma, but there's just something about them that's that's interesting. Like like, and so a lot of times I'll I'll just get on a person's social media feed and just sort of see how they are in real life or see how they present themselves in real life. And that gives me a sense of, you know, what their vibe is like. Mm -hmm. And then that makes it easier to, to know like, are you, what you're working with, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so she was somebody that she had sent in a, a one line audition and I checked out her social media feed and she's also a filmmaker and made these weird sort of trippy little like art films and I was like, oh, that's an interesting person. Beyond being, like, super, super beautiful and, sure. like, uh, oh, charismatic. Yeah. She's like, great. She's just cool and interesting. And so, yeah, it was, I, I just wanted to work with, like, real artists on this movie. But, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, she was one of the, the first sort of pieces. And there's something, like, fun about, like, discovering someone and, uh, you know, it's been it's been great to see uh, you know how her performance is being received by people because I think she's incredibly talented and she'll go on to make a bunch of other movies. So. No, I, I she don't. was she was yeah very seducing and very real within this role of Sarah uh, haunting uh, Dawn uh, the whole time within the house. Yeah, I don't doubt that she'll go yeah. on to to do much more. I think you did find someone here. I think she she just fucking nailed it. <laughs> oh, she was so good! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But and I, I and I I liked uh, um, I Phil's I guess Don's wife. Uh, it's that that's Triste Kelly Dunn. She did a good job. You don't see her until really she doesn't really come out and shine until the very end. There, um, as most of the movie, you just see her on the phone with Don, but. Uh, she was kind of a beast at the very end there with uh, with the hammer yeah. herself and, you know, coming out and seeing all these little haunts within the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was the, the, you know, part of the trick with casting that role is you need somebody who uh, is, is going to has enough presence to register for the first two thirds of the movie when they're just seen at arm's distance on a phone. Like that, that requires, you know, real presence. Otherwise you're just in the background. And, uh, you know, for this movie to make the point it wants to make, we need to, uh, meet that character on her own terms outside of, uh, her husband's, uh, bias perspective. So, uh, when that character walks through the, the, the front door, you need an actor who the audience already has, uh, registered for the first two thirds and then, uh, an actor that you know Bill, they basically get to meet again uh, in the last act of the movie. Yeah, uh, and so she's just got this great. She's just got a great presence. She's a, a phenomenal actor. So I did. You know, I did like. That. I like that Definitely. dynamic because yeah, really, you have isolation with him, and then you're experiencing his madness, and then uh, usually that's it. But then we completely switch because he's gone. To to her madness for the last act, and it's just sort of it, it gives you a fresh perspective towards the end. I just I noticed it in my head while watching. I'm like, oh, cool! Like we're gonna get a new take on things. It almost makes it a little more chaotic and a little more horrific, in my opinion. Oh yeah, yeah, excellent. Oh, that was the intention. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. I, I I just must say, if uh, if Sarah was in my house all of a sudden as as like a ghost, and she came on to me with that with that look it'd be i i'd almost fall in don's shoes it'd be very hard for me to say no yeah well now you know what happens if you do do that yeah <laughs> twice i do i do like though um at, at first i wasn't sure at first i didn't like it but just with the ease that he cheats on his wife and then and then doesn't make a big deal out of it at first i was sort of like what the what the fuck is this but then um, as we got a little deeper into the movie, I was like, oh, he is a struggling, you know, alcoholic. He's, he's done these things before. Uh, and now I understand that it fills out his, basically his, uh, ultimate decision of, of going down the wrong path and then meeting his demise because of it. And so it really, for him to just, uh, be like, oh yeah, why not? This girl's right here. Let's just do it. Yeah. It, it was really a strong character yeah. move. And I, I ended up liking it. <laughs> uh, yeah, me, me too, for sure. Yeah. yeah I think that, you know the story I wanted to tell is about uh, somebody who 
just keeps making the wrong choices. And, and it's not because they're dumb or unlucky or, or whatever. They, they're making the wrong choices because they want to. Mm-hmm. And that seemed interesting mm-hmm. to me because I, I think that's something that all of us in our own lives uh, do every single day. Oh, yeah. You have the option to do the right thing or do the wrong thing. And, and I just wanted to make a movie that sort of reminds people that each th- that is a, a choice we all make. And, you know, it's up to us. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And, and like, uh, you know, I think for a haunted house movies, normally it's the house corrupts the person who comes into it. And, and in this case, I, I just wanted to be like, no, the house is basically uh, uh, fair and balanced. And, mm, and yeah. it's going to do to you whatever you know, bullshit you bring into it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and 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 that's like kind of like 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 what it what it seemed like 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 the more they fucked with the house, like repairing it and replacing holes and painting, the more they tried to fix the house, the more that the house like fucked with them. When uh, when Don's friend Milo um, came in, you know, and started helping, um, you know, he should have never went in there because <laughs> yeah. uh, you know they're they're fixing thing, fixing thing, things up, and now he met his demise too. So it's well, just like, and I I I also was intrigued by uh, before Don knocks her in the head with the freaking sledgehammer. Um, he's sitting there apologizing, and by that moment, I mean most people probably know that this girl is somehow supernatural you know like what is going on with this girl she's not a normal girl here you know and so at that point i'm like oh he's apologizing things are going over smoothly uh of course he he ruins it right away by smashing her but i almost wanted to like figure out or or think about what would have happened like he he went he took a step back toward toward the the light side or the good side w- would the house mm-hmm. have gone easier on him or would have all have stopped or you know it's just curious to think about what would have happened <laughs> yeah 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 that, that's it i mean in in my mind yeah yeah like uh, <laughs> you know the the pastor character says it you know some people move in and, and make it a a home and they're fine and other people you know are never able to to, to to settle mm-hmm. yeah it's yeah. based totally entirely on the, your own uh uh sort of morality or you know yeah how, how you're behaving uh and so like in that scene where he's apologizing to her like that's a that's a sociopath mm-hmm. that's somebody mm-hmm. just trying to convince somebody that things are going to be different and he knows what he's going to do like he it's a it's a con mm-hmm. yeah Yep. Um, I do want to touch on uh, the other main character of any horror film, which is the special effects, was, um, which were fabulous. Is this uh, a team yeah. that you've, you've worked with before and just had a lot of confidence in, or, or what? So it was a combination of uh, the, the makeup effects uh, were done by Dan Martin, who uh, had worked with Ben Wheatley. He did Lords of Chaos. He just did the new Richard Stanley movie. Mm. Uh, and he just uh, has done, you know, dozens of mm-hmm. uh, sort of horror films. Like he, he loves horror. He's incredible. So, sure. Uh, so yeah. He, uh, he did, created the mask for Sadie and did all the, uh, you know, all the gags that, that take place with the actors. And then Courtney and Hillary Angela, the production designers. Uh, we're sort of in charge of the mechanical gun. So when stuff is coming out of outlets and bursting through pipes and stuff, that was just us YouTube <laughs> figuring out, well, how do you, uh, you know, how do you make an air cannon and, and stuff like that? So, uh, the, the, both of them, uh, both Courtney and Hillary and Dan are, like I said earlier, just real artists. And, sure. Uh, the movie wouldn't be nearly as, as good as it is without them. Okay. So good at what they do. We're, we're, uh, your audio didn't is is not quite as good all of a sudden. Oh, oh, uh, oh there you uh, are. <laughs> it might be my phone. Yeah. Sorry no worries. No worries. But there, no. there it is. That's great. And is Dan? We, we he, basically heard you. Is he? I, I looked him up a little bit. Is he um, a UK guy? Is he not in the US? Yeah, yeah, UK guy, and he, uh, the other producer, Greg Newman, was like, hey, I saw this movie, Lords of Chaos, and 
man, there's a special effects gag in there that's so good. Like, it turned my stomach, and maybe we should bring him over. And I'm like, uh, yeah, he's <laughs> worked with Ben Wheatley. Yeah, let's bring yeah. him over. So, yeah. Uh, it was super fortunate. That's great. Yeah, but- Wow. It, it it really did pan out great. I just the special effects. Uh, it it really makes the movie uh, more exciting to me, and I, I just was excited for what was going to happen next. And obviously, yeah. I there's a thing with someone inside the walls and stuff coming out of the walls, and him. Uh, the sledgehammer was such an iconic weapon within this movie. Whether you know you're hitting someone in the back of the head or, or pounding out the walls, I just I just love I just love hammers and you know, you know hitting things. Uh, so so that was a really great uh, and creepy aspect of things inside the wall and him trying to find this this girl crawling within the walls or in like the house breathing and bleeding that, that was a really, really yeah. cool um, yeah. aspect of this movie that I, that I just loved. Um, oh, sweet. Thank d- you, man. Yeah. yeah. I also um, noticed the soundtrack too. Um, mainly. I don't, I don't know if you, uh, you know, hand pick some of these things, but uh, uh, like the converge song, we're, we're big metal fans, Scotty and I, so yeah. we're always yeah. Listening and so you know we found a few gems in there. Was that something that you wanted to specifically choose to do these these certain numbers? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, you know that's when I go for a jog. That's what I'm listening to. <laughs> so, Hell yeah, that's uh, awesome. It gets uh, you yeah. going. Yeah, and, and you know the benefit of of the wall writing the script. Uh, I sort of came up with the idea of, of tagging the, the movie with the big black song at the end. And uh, so early in the process, I was in my head. And then I started thinking, like, well, maybe Steve Albini would do the score. Mm-hmm. And knowing that, you know, when he said yes and he came on board, suddenly these bands that maybe I, I normally wouldn't reach out to seemed like, well, they'll know who Steve Albini is and maybe they'll be more open to, you know, contributing a song to a, to a small little horror film. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah, super, super fortunate. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had a neurosis in the, uh, in the temp track and Steve knew them and he reached out to them. And then bastard priest was just, I was in the record store with my girlfriend and we were just looking at records and I was like, Holy shit, look at this cover. Bastard <laughs> priest. And then never heard of them. And so I was just like bought the record based on the cover and we went home and listened to it and I reached out to them and so yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. We, we actually have a, uh, we're in a metal band, uh, like, uh, a death, death metal band. And so we, uh, we definitely attest to that and we're like, Oh, this is, it made the movie just that yeah. much more awesome for me. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. And not even, um, not even those songs I felt with the mixture. I don't know if this was a conscious decision or not, but, um, <clears throat> I felt like leading into ah, what possibly I'm trying to remember exactly where it happened, but into the second act, sort of where you, you get the idea that, oh, this house isn't fucking around. Um, it brought in some like dark, um, you know, symphonic or orchestra style, um, yeah. Stuff yeah. and I just I don't know I just I don't know if you did Scotty but I just noticed it right away I was like oh we haven't really heard this yet and now mm-hmm. it makes me think the house is getting it's not fucking around you know <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. That, so that's Steve and and, and uh, Tim Madet and Allison Chesley who who were you know musicians but they basically live scored it they'd all watch the scene together and, and just jam and figure out you know what the piece of music was going to be and mm. uh yeah they did a great job of sort of shaping an overall musical arc for yeah. the film and that's that's what you want you know yeah, it was yeah. it was awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, shit. The, so it comes out uh, tomorrow, right? Is that on on all basically streaming platforms? Yeah, I think uh, I think iTunes is uh, the the first one, but I think it's available on the other ones starting Tuesday. So okay. it's in select theaters. A bunch awesome. of random theaters. So I'm not even going to try to <laughs> try to list them, but it's theaters across the country. You can definitely get it on iTunes tomorrow uh, if you uh, if you're itching to see it right away. That's that's the best place. And then I think Amazon and Voodoo and all the other platforms uh, starting next week. 
Sure, great. And so for you guys listening, um, probably while you're listening to that, this tomorrow is today. So you'll, uh, you, yeah. Can, yeah. you can you can now get it today, uh, the 25th of October on iTunes, uh, and then next week on everything else. Definitely be on the lookout for it. Um, I mean, gosh, this is a, yeah. an awesome directorial debut and writing debut. Are you, what's next? I mean, are you wanting to direct more? Are you going to sink back to, not sink back, are you going to change to producing for a couple <laughs> yeah. more, you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, writing and directing more and I'm still producing as well. So it's all about just making movies. And uh, and so I feel very lucky to, to be able to do it and uh, yeah. I'm excited to continue doing it. Awesome. awesome awesome well great. uh thanks travis for joining us we really appreciate it yeah this was great thanks guys yeah have a great and, halloween yeah 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 you too, man yeah we'll, it's halloween we'll uh we'll keep an Excellent. eye out for all future projects all right i'm gonna go crawl into the bathroom and try not to die <laughs> yes <laughs> yes that sounds like a plan all right well thank you guys for listening and uh we'll catch you on the next episode see you guys don't you blame the movies Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos more creative. Oh, yes. There will be blood.